Yeah, I actually just jumped in quickly here with this topic because actually should somebody else uh, have taken a slot but got ill, so I only heard that a day ago. Um, <clears throat> but I have an issue that I would love to um, talk about a bit and this is uh, the attack on free-ranging wolves that I experience in Austria and possibly in other countries too. Um, the wolves have been deliberately exterminated in Europe um, in the 19th century. Um, the area where I live in Upper Styria, there has been uh, specifically appointed hunters for no other reason than to exterminate the wolves in this time period. And it was a very clear uh, goal and that was in order to preserve game animals that the hunters then can kill. And um, <clears throat> since then, occasionally wolves have come into Austria, here is some statistics, and they all have been killed essentially with the sort of agreement of, um, of, of the hunting fraternity at least. And, um, <clears throat> but now they have been an established, now they have for the first time established wolf packs. I mean they have come back into Europe all over the place. This is um, approximately where they, uh, the wolves have arrived. Um, Southeast Europe, they have always been there, also in, the, in, in Italy and the Apennines and in northern uh, Spain and obviously also in Scandinavia, but not very densely populated in the Baltic states. But from there they move now west, they are now in all Alpine countries and um, so they're basically coming in and, um, and the uh, uh, directive of the EU says that uh, they're actually supposed to be protected. And um, there are also all wolves in Austria now. They, uh, there have been uh, lone wolves coming by ever so often, but um, a few years ago, three years ago, maybe the first wolf pack established itself. This is real Austrian wolf dog shit. And these are pictures from, from these wild cameras that are just um, automatically take the pictures of, of real Austrian wolves. It's, it's uh, funny enough, the, the right-wing government, who is very used to ex the, uh, separating foreigners from, um, from people living there, or somebody living there, they now distinguish between the good wolves, that are the Austrian wolves, and the bad wolves that come from, from abroad. They even manage doing that. Anyway, these are the good wolves. This, um, this one wolf pack living in the northern, eastern Austria, and there's a second one there are two now. Um, <clears throat> the thing that um, comes to mind first is the evil wolves eating Little Red Riding Hood, uh, maybe us too and our children. And, but there has been, as the, this up there on the right is actually a real, very dangerously looking, obviously, uh, wolf from the southern Carpathians in Romania. Um, and, um, yeah. Elli Radinger and Günther Bloch are two Germans who um, watch wolves in Northern America in uh, Banff National Park and in Yellowstone and they have written a book about it now that the wolves are coming and they say in 1996 to 2014 they have met, oh, <laughs> it's sadly not as it's supposed to be, there's the number missing. Yeah, this is when, when you use a computer with a stick, if, if it was my computer, it would probably be there. But anyway, the, the number was something like 3,700 or 7,300 even um, meetings with wolves they had and um, never any aggression. So they can't be too dangerous. There is also a work now, a scientific study on wolf attacks on people, um, especially since 1800. And they found in Romania, where there have always been wolves the whole time, and about 3,000, there have only been eight attacks in this study, it says, and they have looked in very detail. No human died. In Slovenia, with 50 wolves, Croatia with 250, no attacks. In Slovakia, one attack, 400 wolves. And my personal experience also is that wolves don't attack. Um, I've been in southern Carpathians uh, ever so often for weeks, and this is a picture that I took. Um, there's the wolf paw and the paw of my dog friend. We followed a wolf pack of 13 wolves for five days on the tracks in the winter. So it was easy to follow and they came to our tent in the night but always stayed 50 meters away and never harmed us at all. So there was no threat whatsoever. So I believe um, if people are talking about the threat by 
by the wolves for humans, then this is deliberate propaganda. What do wolves eat, actually? There is a study of German wolves, where the wolves have arrived some 10 years ago. And this is, this is in German, though, but um, here you see farmed animals make up 1.7%, while fruits, especially apples, make up 1.9%. So they eat more fruits than sheep. What they mainly eat there is uh, deer and stags and wild boar. This is the, the main diet. And um, this is similar with the Austrian wolves. There has also been a study now, but not in much detail as that. But they mostly eat stags in, in Austria because they happen to be in an area where there are more stags. But um, what, what uh, remains to be, uh, what remains as a fact is that they mostly eat wild animals and a very little um, farmed animals. <clears throat> but in Austria, at least, there's a real media frenzy against wolves. There's really no day passing by where there's not an article about how awful wolves are, how they threaten Vienna. This is now the big story. Um, the wolves are marching into Vienna. There's, so they're like, like, like um, a besiege. They're standing outside the door. We must do something. Um, yeah, um, it, it sounds funny. And if you look at it, then it feels like it can't be taken seriously, but it is. There is a shift in public opinion due to that constant barrage of negative reporting. It's also funny that there are now the farmers crying on television. Our sheep have died. Uh, why don't they cry when they bring their sheep to the slaughterhouse? Um, it remains a mystery, but um, it's incredibly sad if the sheep are being eaten by a wolf. And it's also funny, you know, my dog is vegan, the farmers love to say, your dog is vegan, he should be eating meat. But if he eats their sheep, then they cry. So what should he do? Um, the, the only difference is if you pay for it. If you pay for it, then they don't cry. <laughs> so it's only about money in reality. Um, we, do do, we do school talks, and last time we were in this area where the wolves were, talking to seven-year-old children. I had this experience for decades. They all love animals. You show them pictures of animals and they say, love that and love that. And um, you can easily reach the heart. And this year, for the first time, the whole class of children said, wolves are bad. All other animals are good and nice and they, they love their children. And so we talk about usually about the needs of animals and are they similar to humans and love of animals, children, parents, and um, and, and pain and fear and happiness. But with wolves, suddenly the story is different. They are bad, they don't love, they just hate, and they kill out of lust. This is the newest news. There is a big hunter who, who has a, a, a hunting enclosure and he's killing 600 um, wild boar a year there, enclosed, um, so animals that are actually bred. And, and he says the wolf kills out of lust. So what does he do? But um, <coughs> apparently, for the wolf, this is um, dreadful. And if you, if you read these uh, things, then it becomes clear that the community is supposed to be up in arms. Everybody needs a gun, and we need to kill the wolves. This is what, what, uh, what, this, what this media frenzy is driving. Um, if you look at what they actually, the damage and the quotes they do to farmed animals, then you see in Austria 2017, the statistics is 30 sheep, so about 31 sheep killed by wolves. And 8,000 sheep actually died of weather conditions. Um, 90,000 sheep were killed by humans, and 30 with wolves. But still, we must make them up to be the evil ones. In Switzerland, um, 10,000 uh, sheep die a year. There are lots more wolves already and have been longer established. 500 sheep are killed by wolves. But since they have started protection of the sheep herds, um, the number of uh, sheep dying out in the mountains um, f has decreased from 10,000 to 5,000. So, uh, under, in the sum, at the end of the day, um, the protection of sheep um, from wolves has led to the protection of sheep from weather, and the damage has decreased a lot. But all this is being just um, silenced. Um, Talking with animal protection societies or even animal protectionists, some very um, outspoken, I found that people are hesitant to publicly be in favor of the wolf as animal protectionists. It might be, because they argue to me at least, because um, wolves kill animals 
And we animal protectionists don't want that. We don't, the wolves harm other animals and we want to protect other animals. So it sounds as if it's smart to keep the wolf out and protect those animals. As if human hunters don't go there and kill them instead. Um, um, also, I find that at that point it's important to recognize that in the wild, if there are wolves there, still most wild animals are happy most of the time, and that is for evolutionary reasons. Um, the evolutionary feeling of happiness has come for the normal conditions under which animals live in order to make them uh, able to procreate and to be um, active. This is what the happiness brings with it, evolutionary. So if most animals weren't, then they wouldn't procreate, so they, the evolution has made them to be such that they are most of the time happy. Even if they're violently killed, this is then the short time when they're not happy, but most of the time they are happy. Um, and especially if you look at the influence of humans, then you will find uh, the more influence of humans, the more wildlife suffering. I know, know all of now different examples. And also, if we are too mousy about the wolves being so violent to other animals, um, what about us? You, know, you might say I'm vegan, I'm not harming animals. As a matter of fact, I believe every vegan here in the room or in this conference harms more animals than any wolf ever will because of the lifestyle we have, a very energetic lifestyle. We use um, a lot of energy, we um, produce in a way that is very detrimental to other animals. There is this uh, study by Michael Archer in Australia that says that for every kilogram of wheat protein we cause 55 deaths of mice. And um, if you look at the food production, road building, house building, energy production, or the so-called pest control, and uh, cut it down to our um, involvement, even as vegans, I believe we do a lot more damage than hunters would. I've also added uh, uh, wolves would. I have an example that I re recently read. Um, uh, it's, um, I read a scientific study about this woman and her family. They fled in 1935 from being prosecuted by Stalin into the Siberian tiger and then became um, living and self-sustained there. And because the, when they fled they had no weapons and they had almost no metal stuff, they had to live vegan essentially because they couldn't kill animals. And, and they managed to live there for decades and actually have four children. One of them is her. And, um, and for, for, for two reasons I say that. Firstly, the way they live is um, very, um, uh, very, with very little violence to other beings. So it's not civilization that produces the most violence-free life with the least damage, but it is a vegan, self-sustained wilderness life that produces that. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the eco-footprint, for example, of her and her family, considering that they just pick berries, they pick mushrooms, um, they couldn't even cook because they didn't have metal pots. So all the pots they had were made out of the bark of birch trees. And um, yes, and they had um, obviously um, a very small impact on the surroundings. Um, when they were eventually found after the Second World War, she was introduced to um, civilization and she found civilization disgusting and she moved back into the wild where she's still living, although she was never ethical vegan, so she's not living vegan anymore because she now is happy of using metal pots for cooking and using um, an axe uh, for cutting, uh, which she couldn't do before, and also using um, fishing rods for, for fishing uh, and, and uh, living non-vegan anymore. But what I want to say is that um, firstly, the wild living is the least eco-footprint and the most cruelty-free version. And secondly, so superior to civilization. And secondly, that she as a person who experienced that actually felt better, even though they had so and so often problems with being hungry, um, with having not enough food, with having weather, bad weather, all these things the typical wild living animals experience. Also they lived with wolves, they lived with bears, they lived with lynx, which might mean occasionally being scared or being threatened. She still preferred that. So I wouldn't just easily say wildlife has a better deal, uh, a worse deal than civilized humans. And um, last but not least, the right to autonomy for wildlife um, is, is much better fulfilled, even if 
they suffer more than um, than for for animals living under the paternalistic husbandry of humans. This um, slide was shown in the key uh, note speech yesterday, and it essentially says that autonomy is very important for human beings. Um, all apparently a lot of scientific literature proves that um, you must have control, perceived or actual, about your life. Then you, then only then are you mentally and physically healthy. Okay, um, I suggest this is not human beings, it's actually conscious beings who are meant um, with this because consciousness eventually means, or essentially means evolutionary, that you want to, that you decide yourself. And uh, yet you're capable of conscious decisions. And any being who is capable of that needs um, autonomy for mental and physical health. And if this is the case, then our ideal should be uh, self-sustained wildlife animal communities, which the wolf might help to establish without human intervention. A few points about the effect of wolves um, that have been found. Uh, firstly, <clears throat> it enables a self-sustained autonomous wildlifting animal societies living together. Um, if it's not so, then there is a, in, in Holland, in Netherlands, there is an area that seems to be um, without big carnivores and there are, uh, we always get um, pictures and films from the hunting fraternity that show us that animals starve there. And, um, <clears throat> and I said, so we need human hunting. If you had wolves, then we didn't, wouldn't need human hunting. Also, it turns out that if there are wolves there, then the populations are healthier, there are um, less um, parasitic worms. Um, this is mostly because those animals that are caught by parasitic worms are then killed and eaten by the wolves and they don't hand on these illnesses to other animals. Um, and also, um, wolves obviously kill the weakest and, um, and uh, humans don't. If they hunt, they kill those with the biggest trophies. So there's a difference in the healthy and the health of the wild animal populations if there are wolves present. There's also a regrowing of forests. Um, here you see, oh good. Um, here you see a picture where there had been this wild boar in huge amount of animals, and then there's fewer wild boar, and you see the beginning of small of trees coming up. There's been seven different species of tree per square meter that starts to grow. And this is a statistics of damage to the forest um, without wolves, um, by deer especially, and, and stags. And you see that 88%, this is the red area, this is different years, 88% um, of the forest is damaged, um, severely damaged. And the yellow is a bit damaged, and this is healthy young forest growth. So you see that um, without wolves and with human hunting, there is a huge damage to the trees because humans um, are incapable of uh, wildlife management. There's also more species of animals. It's also turned out that um, there are suddenly, uh, if there are fewer wild boar, then there are more mice. If there are more mice, there are different um, bird species that come in and, and can breed in these areas, which couldn't breed before. So there's a number of these um, uh, positive uh, loops that actually produce a very different wildlife community if we allow wolves to be there and don't kill them. Ah, good. Um, also, I find an important point as somebody who has followed hunts and watched hunting with, by humans that there are so and so often animals just shot at and injured and then they crawl into the undergrowth. I've seen driven shoots um, where there were, I think, 90 wild boar shot and 60 additional one just escaped uh, wounded and had to live for the next days um, with a shot wound they eventually died of. If the wolf is chasing this animal, either they get them or they don't. If they don't, then they are not injured. If they get them, then they are dead. So there's also um, a lot less suffering if you allow wolves to be there. And especially I'll come to that, um, the political dimension, that it um, <coughs> takes the last justification for hunting. And that's important because we have um, done a number of cases to the Constitutional Court in Austria 
applying for land not to be hunted because in Austria you're forced to hunt the land. And uh, we, we asked the Constitutional Court to establish this uh, right not to hunt on your land. And um, which sounds weird for people who haven't got much to do with this maybe, but as a fact, the Constitutional Court ruled you have to hunt on your land, essentially because there aren't wolves. If there are wolves, then the Constitutional Court would have to redo this judgment. And that would be important because a lot of people actually don't want hunting on their land. Um, there's also, at least for, for the campaigning, there's also an effect on humans that shouldn't be underestimated. Um, at the moment in Austria, 100,000 car accidents happen each year um, where a car crashes into a deer or a stag, mostly. And um, this leads to 350 injured people and 3 to 4 dead people, humans. Uh, obviously the, um, the animals are most likely all of them dead. Um, this is because the hunters drive the animals to move in the night because they hunt them in the day and it's illegal to hunt in the night. So the animals start moving in the night and there are far larger number of animals there than these um, wild areas would actually be able to keep. So they, they move. They have to move, there are many of them, and they have to move in the night and that leads to these accidents. If you have a wolf, then you would have fewer of those animals and there wouldn't be the pressure to move in the night um, and, and they would be specially uh, spread out more. Uh, without wolves, the animals gather in the deep, dense undergrowth where no hunter is going to. Um, if there are wolves present, then the animals don't stay in the undergrowth because they can't hear the wolves or see the wolves coming. So they spread out far more, especially in the open. And that leads to fewer car accidents. Um, there's also a point that um, a guy just made two talks ago that said um, about our psychological well-being and being productive. He said, don't forget contact to nature. Um, important, contact to nature. What, what is the positive effect of nature? That is that there is no humans there and there's no human influence. So that is nature that is sort of uh, maybe getting in contact with some um, evolutionary old part of yourself. Um, and that happens or that works, the better, the less human-made this nature is. And so um, wolves being present open up for a lot more positive influence, positive effects of nature on the human psyche. I travel to um, South Carpathians because they are wolves, because I, um, I can regenerate much better in a forest where there are wolves present and bears and lynx than in forests where there aren't. Yes, and as a side effect there is tourism. Um, as uh, animal rights people we obviously a bit um, might be see, see that in a, in a different light, but um, in, in Germany there are now a lot of wolf hotels, they offer wolf walks but they never see wolves, they just see the shit of the wolves or maybe um, the tracks of the wolves, but um, in these wolf talks they, uh, they hear um, talks about the wolf and about their, their ecological effects and about their life and um, yes, and wolf schools, uh, they invite schools to get them to a wolf weekend school for children. A again, where they don't meet wolves, but they learn about them and learn about nature. Maybe you could consider that also a positive effect of wolves on humans, because such talks don't exist in Austria, where they are evil beings that need to be persecuted. Um, yes, the political dimension I wouldn't underestimate. Um, <clears throat> there is uh, firstly, the possibility of self-sustained areas of autonomous animal communities with wolves. Without wolves, there will be humans there hunting and killing and managing the wildlife. Without, um, they might not. Um, this is um, me following these wolf tracks for five days. Here you see this was a, a wolf pack with 13 uh, individuals on the, on the big... Um, Meadows in the, in the mountains, uh, they spread out so you can count them. If they walk steep, steep snow or steep um, slopes, then they all walk in the same track. Um, and um, such, uh, so the presence of wolves enables this. Um, without them, I feel that there will always be management. Um, if you look at the Canton Genf, Geneva in, in, in Switzerland, they have banned hunting there in 1976. 
And um, <clears throat> the consequence was that they established a wildlife management. A wildlife management where they um, go and kill animals, not as hunting, they say, but they put in food for animals, they have cameras that see where especially wild boar are, and then they um, kill them in the night by shining light on them and, and shooting them. And it might be much better than um, typical human hunting. It is a billion times better. Uh, I have a lot of experience with the hunting in Austria, and I can say that is a billion times better. But um, it still is um, a permanent pressure on them and the killing, and that might not be necessary if there were wolves present. Um, <clears throat> And um, there is this aspect that we hear now when there is this debate about the wolves in Austria that, um, that uh, there is always the demand that if there is an area or if there are animals they must be usable for humans for profit. And if we managed to allow wolves to establish themselves we would have a population of beings that actually are not profitable but they rather cost society something but they'd still be there for their own sake and not for human sake. And that would be maybe a precedent or a good marking stone for development towards um, accepting non-human animals as beings in their own right, who have actually a right to exist, never mind if they are useful for humans or not. So uh, I wouldn't underestimate these political dimensions. The campaigns that I'm interested in always have such political dimensions because my primary aim is to get society towards um, respect, um, for animals and not, um, yeah, for other things too, but I mean, uh, respect for animals and, and giving them higher political value. Um, there's also been an opinion poll on wolves and, and their appreciation in society, and if you look at that, we see there's 34% are very positive and 40% positive in Austria. Um, now, with this media friends, it might change, but we have a 74% majority that actually would support a campaign, and that sounds a bit like a winnable issue. 13% only say they have a negative attitude, and 4% a very negative attitude towards the wolf coming, and 9% were undecided. They're, with this media hype, they're probably also now on the negative side, but I mean, um, there would be a majority of people appreciating the wolf, and we should use that opportunity um, and, and uh, strengthen it. So our aim is now to go into the rural communities where they have this lynching attitude and uh, get stuck in the middle there and present a show um, with these data and with the pictures um, and, and defending wolves um, verbally. And um, yeah, we're going to see what's happening with this, but um, I believe that it is uh, necessary in order to prevent um, another extermination of the wolf and especially um, this attitude that whenever a wolf is coming they must be shot. Only a dead wolf is a good wolf. This is um, the, the sort of uh, idea that these rural communities are now uh, producing and I think we should, we should counter that. Um, and also obviously going to schools, this is where the children um, grow up who, who eventually run a society and the aim would be to have an understanding for wolves and also an understanding for animals who are not uh, usable for humans, who are not profit, but um, who still are um, <coughs> beings that have, have a right to live by themselves. So, yeah, um, basically what I would like to ask you is to consider uh, a similar um, defense, not ignoring it. Um, if the wolves are uh, being um, treated in, in the media as uh, some evil creature that needs to be removed. Um, many people might think it's nothing to do with animal rights or animal welfare um, because firstly it's a few wolves and if they shoot them look how many chickens there. But then um, <coughs> also that it might be an, a species protection issue and not an animal welfare issue um, or animal rights issue. But um, I hope to show, I hope to have shown to you that the political dimension is quite important. It is a decisive um, point where um, where we could sort of open up a new path for society of accepting that nature is not only there to be used, 
and there is, must be space for animals who are not profitable for humans and they still have a right to live. So I think it is an issue for animal rights and uh, animal protection groups um, to also defend the wolf and the public. And, and now is the time for doing this because the wolves are coming in now and if um, the stage is set for killing them then they will be gone and there will be nobody left to defend. Um, in the lower Austrian province, one of the nine provinces in Austria, they have recently um, established a new law that will take effect, I think, uh, in the beginning of November, um, that allows killing wolves. They uh, want to set up things like if wolves approach humans um, more than twice within 30 meters, they should be able to kill them immediately. Um, if they go to sheep, they should be able to kill them. So it's already starting the new extermination wave and um, yeah to step into this and um, to stop them doing this would be uh, would be necessary to do right now at this moment so if anybody wants to comment <laughs> are there any questions from the audience Hi, I have a general question about wolves um, because um, there was a case in Germany a couple of days ago, big in the media, where they killed 40 sheep and they just let them lay there, they don't eat them. I'm just curious um, why they do that because it's hard to defend if you can't say they eat them because they don't. So could you, are, are, do you know something about that? Yeah, I mean, um, you can see that with cats, you can see that with, um, with foxes, uh, large carnivores or maybe all carnivores. Um, use opportunities because they they would normally kill and then um, stage uh, ca cache this um, this carrion and come back and eat them um, they would only do that if it's easy so um, if this is a sheep enclosure where the sheep can't escape then for them it's easy then they kill and then um, would wanna just leave it and come back and eat them um, so the problem comes with why aren't they defended why isn't there possibility for them to escape or why isn't there something that keeps the, the, the wolf away if they want to um, keep those sheep um, but uh, yeah it, I, it's actually natural it's not something that um, that way you would say this, this, these wolves are um, mad or problem wolves or something this is uh, sort of the normal reaction for them Um, I'm just wondering what your opinion is on wolf sanctuaries, where the wolves aren't um, in the wild, but they're kind of just like kept in one area to try to repopulate. Um, I'm not sure what 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 it is, what you mean. Um, is it something fenced in, or is um, it not fenced? In? Yes, I'm from California, where they have in the mountains like there's a specific wolf sanctuary, and it's a large area, but it is fenced in. And what is it for? Um, I believe it's for repopulation of the wolves. So the wolves are um, fenced in and when they have kids they can walk out? Or? No. <laughs> so repopulate what exactly? I'm not sure. I just wanted to. I, okay. I didn't know if that was a common thing that was in other parts yeah. of the world as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean there, there is sanctuaries on the quotes. Um, in, in Austria, for example, this is an area that belongs to the army and they don't hunt there, which is why this wolf pack was able to establish themselves there. I mean, actually have pictures from um, how, how well the wolf understand where is hunting and where is not, and they actually keep inside this army area. If you look at um, the area, they really fill it out, but they're never outside. But, um, so in some sense, this is a sanctuary. <laughs> and without that, they wouldn't have been able to establish themselves. But there's no fence around it. So they, they just realize somehow where is being human hunting or threat or where is not. But the kids of those, of those packs, when they leave in two, three years of age, then they leave the area. And these are the ones that are the problem now for, the, for the, these, these, Austrian, um, these Austrian hunters. Um, yeah, so I, I find um, sanctuaries a bit problematic if they are enclosures where, where you breed. I mean, these pictures are from, from um, the Wolf Science Center in, in in Eastern Austria, so there's also not something that I ethically would now so completely find ideal. 
Um, but what you see, these are all North American wolves that have come possibly from sanctuaries or maybe zoos. They've um, got them there in order to um, also make them familiar with dogs, as you see, and study their cognitive abilities and, and behavior. Um, but um, what you see there is that these wolves are very friendly to humans. They walk those wolves in the outside area. I've been there, I've seen it. They, these wolves don't harm anybody. Uh, they lick your hands without knowing you, you know? This is, um, you can, I, I was inside with these wolves and they didn't threaten me at all or kill me or anything. Any other questions? Okay. I have also one question. Uh, the foxes uh, are, from the ecological point of view, a bit similar to wolves. So, are they also regarded that badly as wolves? And if not, uh, uh, why? <laughs> yeah, it's a, a good question. I mean, in, in England, as maybe man, many of you know, there is the aristocratic pastime of chasing foxes and killing them. With horse, on horseback, with hounds, with a pack, pack of dogs. And um, <clears throat> they always defended that by saying dog foxes are so really dangerous and really awful. And um, they actually managed in their um, newspapers, in these daily newspapers that are so supportive of this um, aristocracy there, like Daily Mail and whatever they're called, um, these newspapers actually reported on foxes attacking children. Um, they, they were getting into the pram and biting the, the child in the head. It's strange, yeah, that in countries where the fox is not being chased around, <laughs> no fox ever attacks a child. But in the countries where you need a reason, suddenly you have pictures of, of foxes attacking children and eating little cats and all, all these awful things. The typical English person is up in arms if a cat is being attacked by a dog. So, this is dreadful. In reality, they don't. I've seen it often that a fox meets a cat and they don't kill each other. Um, <clears throat> so it's a lot of it is just media made up stuff and this is very deliberate and very thought through. Um, the media is in the hands of, of hunters in a large amount and, and hunting, especially hunters, fear the presence of the wolf because they lose their justification. This is really what it is all about. They don't want to have wolves there because they want to say in the absence of wolves we sadly have to hunt. And then they do all their hunting atrocities, which includes um, hunting with dogs, hunting um, underground, um, breeding animals and killing them, and having driven shoots and, and uh, paying huge amounts of... So all this, uh, I was at the Constitutional Court, I heard them argue, and the Constitutional Court upheld all these ways of hunting just because there aren't wolves here. And that, so the hunters realize that, and so they want to they wanna kill the wolf. But that doesn't mean that foxes are spared in Austria. They still want to kill them, especially because the foxes kill the game birds. They want to release game birds and the foxes um, go there and eat them. And this costs 10 euro each game bird, so they, they want to kill the foxes. And so there's, it's um, still so that in Austria, which is reasonably small, there are 65,000 foxes killed a year by hunters. And you're allowed to kill them whenever and wherever. There's all these rules on... on, on um, <clears throat> on a fair hunt, it's all gone out of the window when it goes against, um, against foxes and other uh, carnivores, um, small carnivores. Um, but there is um, light at the end of the tunnel. There are some areas now where they allow foxes, where they're not being killed. And one can see that there's no harm to ecology. The contrary, it's much better for ecology if you allow foxes to live. And um, so the hunters losing the argument there. But um, yeah, um, foxes don't kill deer and stags and wild boar, and humans want to kill them. So this is why foxes are not so bad as wolves. I see. So thank you once again, and thank you for your reaction.